Right. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. My name is Christoph Schneider, Head of IT Development and Operations um, with the Global LEI Foundation. And today we're going to talk about an update on digital identity using the verifiable LEI, or short, VLEI. We will start with a quick overview of the Global LEI system before we look at the verifiable LEI and what it can do. Um, we will look at the progress that has recently been made in this area, and we will end with um, looking at a first implementation of VLEIs in a real application, uh, in this case, Glyph's annual report, and what we have done there with partial signing. So, the Global LEI Foundation is a Swiss non-for-profit foundation created by the Financial Stability Board, uh, located at the Bank for International Settlements in Basel. Um, it's overseen by a so-called regulatory oversight committee, which consists of public bodies, um, 71 regulators and 19 observers in total from about 50 countries. So a very global set of um, organizations. And then the foundation itself has a board of directors um, with 18 independent people also uh, globally. We're working with 39 partners currently, which uh, actually perform the LEI issuance. And um, to date, 2.2 million LEIs have been issued. Here we have a graphical representation of the global LEI system with, again, the regulatory oversight committee at the top, um, the policymakers, with the GLIFE at the center of the system, implementing these policies and managing the whole system and the local operating units or LEI issuers who perform the actual tasks of LEI issuance and maintaining the reference data which is attached to these. The legal entity identifier or LEI is a 20 digit alphanumeric code. It's a unique identifier that is owned lifelong by the respective legal entity. That means LEIs are not reused. Um, they're there forever. They are never issued again, and they also don't go away if a company ceases to exist. They stay in the database, and you can see that there was once a company, and one that has ended to exist. So it's a truly unique identifier. It comes with associated reference data, um, and it's actually an ISO standard. So can I ask who in this room has actually ever seen a real LEI, a real LEI code? Oh, about half of you, okay. I'll show you one. Um, where are we going tonight? Guinness. Guinness. <laughs> All right, so we're visiting the Glyph website. And um, we're using the search functionality here. And I think it's called the Guinness Storehouse or so. So here's a company, the Guinness Storehouse Limited. And I'll make this a little bit bigger for you. With their unique LEI code and the reference data includes the legal name. They're registered at the company's register of Ireland with this registration number here. Um, the entity legal form is a private company limited by shares. And we also see the address, St. James Gate in Dublin 8, Dublin. Remember that, this is where you need to go tonight. <laughs> so, um, and why do we need a legal entity identifier? Why don't we just say, well, it's Guinness Storehouse Limited. It's easy, or we're going to Guinness tonight. The reason is there are many companies on the globe and organizations, and some of them have pretty similar names. So identifying by name is not the best idea. I did a search just in the global LEI repository for organizations that have the word Guinness in their name. That brings you 72 organizations. And if you, even if you limit it to Ireland, it's still 27 organizations with Guinness in the name. So if you want to do business with one of them, good luck if you don't have a unique identification. That's what the LEI is for. The 2.2 million LEIs are distributed across the globe with um, a big focus in Europe um, that depends on regulation that has been issued there that mandates many organizations to have an LEI, then followed by North America 
and very closely now followed by the Asia Pacific region and this is actually very strong growing. So I think we will see many more LEIs also in, in the Asian region now where we have generally biggest growth also in other areas. Why did we think about a verifiable LEI? The legal entity identifier is a fantastic tool to uniquely identify organizations. But when I stand in front of you and I show you this 20 digit alphanumeric code, what do you know? You don't even know whether it exists. I could have made that up. It's just a combination of letters and numbers. And you can now go, of course, to live and look it up and see, okay, it exists and it represents this organization. How do you know that I'm working for this organization? You don't. If you know it, you still don't know if I'm authorized to act in a role for this organization. And this brings us as a result to the problem that all these things have to be checked by you even if I have a legal entity identifier and that is a manual approach and it's costly. So what we want to do is we want to solve the common problem of lack of trust and the costs involved for creating trust. The use case for the VLEI as it stands here is decentralized identification and verification for organizations but also for persons who represent their organization in either an official or a functional role and I will come in more detail to this differentiation of roles. Either way we always have a triple concept when we talk about persons acting for organizations. We have the organization, the legal entity, we have the person and we have a specific role that they're acting in for this organization. It doesn't always have to be an employee, uh, it can be other roles. And what we're doing is we're taking this real work approach into a digital representation by putting these three facts into a container uh, which is cryptographically bound to the holder of the keys, so the holder of such a credential and then we call that a VLEI. The VLEI ecosystem comes with a chain of trust and this chain of trust is established by Glyph issuing a verifiable credential to what we call qualified VLEI issuers, that is the pendant to the LEI issuer in the classical LEI world, organizations who will issue, revoke, maintain verifiable LEIs for clients um, and which in turn will issue credentials to legal entities and also, this is not clearly visible here because it's a simplified diagram to certain persons. We're coming to that. But legal entities will also be able to issue certain role credentials to their own employees, suppliers, whoever may act in their role, um, depending on the type of credential. Looking at a bit more detail of the credentials that are issued along the trust chain, Glyph issues a qualified VLEI issuer, VLEI, to all qualified VLEI issuers. And the elements contained in such a credential are really limited. It's just the qualified VLEI issuer's LEI. Why? It's sufficient. The type of credential together with the LEI that uniquely identifies the qualified VLEI issuer or short QVI is enough information for you to know that this is an authorized organization who can work in this system. The same is true for the uh, credentials that are issued by the qualified VLEI issuers oh, that is right, yeah. to the legal entities, the legal entity VLEI. It just contains the legal entity's LEI because again the type of credential plus the LEI is enough to somebody to prove that they just represent this organization on a legal entity level. It's a bit different for the official organizational role VLEIs that are issued um, by qualified VLEI issuers to persons acting in roles for legal entities. They contain these three elements that I have presented before, the triple concept. And the same is true for what we call engagement context role VLEIs. They are technically the same, but um, they have a different um, verification background, and I'll come to that. So focusing on the official organizational role credentials. Um, official organizational role credentials can be verified not only towards the legal entity, but also against an official source. And that makes them different um, because there's, a, so to speak, a third party verification. And that is performed by VLEI issuers to have the third party verification and not just the legal entity claiming that that's an 
official organizational role that gives an additional layer of trust. Um, an example for a VLEI official organizational role credential would be a CEO or CFO or a director. Um, and example use cases for such credentials can include carrying out official duties and powers conferred legally or required by regulation. Uh, so for example, annual reports or Sarban Oxley reports or carrying out internal policies, duties or tasks, for example, approving strategic plans or signing employee service awards. In contrast to that, the engagement context role credentials are just verified by the legal entity. So there is no third party verification against a public source and that's why legal entities can issue them themselves to people acting in their capacity, which makes the whole thing very flexible for use cases where this is sufficient, where you do not need official organizational roles. An example again would be role credentials issued by a legal entity to authorized suppliers. And then with that tool at hand, they could require authorized suppliers to submit invoices digitally signed with the VLEI role credentials they previously issued to them and by this um, preventing fraudulent invoices because they would just accept yeah, correctly signed invoices. So a lot of these day-to-day -day problems would walk away with such a solution. That's an example for ECR credentials. Yes, the VLEI ecosystem is in full accordance with trust over IP standards. I think you have seen a lot of people from trust over IP walking around here. They have also a booth right over there. Um, so just quickly, um, Trust over IP Foundation has been launched in May 2020 in the middle of the beginning of the pandemic. Um, in its first six months, it has grown from 27 to 125 members in, yeah, in less than six months. And I just talked to Judith, who told me it's now more than 400, uh, which is really crazy. Um, and there are founding members, um, very, very well-known names, including MasterCard, IBM, Accenture, the government of British Columbia, for those who have heard John Jordan this morning, LG, GS1, Mitra Sigpa, R3, Kiva, and also a bunch of university. And the Global LEI Foundation also joined Trust over IP as a contributing member, so there are different types of membership. And I think I don't have to explain what the Linux Foundation is at this conference. Coincidentally, um, Trust over IP Foundation is holding its first summit uh, ever in person tomorrow here in this building. Um, but if you're not registered yet, then uh, I heard don't even try, they're completely overbooked already. And um, yes, but I think this is really important. Trust over IP has defined two stacks, um, an, a governance stack and a technology stack. And um, verifiable LEIs will be issued by two types of VLEI issuers. On the one hand, um, we expect, and by now we know also, that some classical LEI issuers will take the additional role of VLEI issuance, but there can also be organizations that have not been LEI issuers yet who can become VLEI issuers, and then they, they just use some services that Live provides in order to use what LEI issuers have already at hand. But it's not a prerequisite to be an LEI issuer to become a VLEI issuer. But independent of the type of VLEI issuer, all of these organizations will go through um, a qualification process um, under the GLIFE VLEI ecosystem governance framework. And that is a trust over IP compliant layer four governance framework, as you can see here, the, the upper arrow. Um, and the VLEI credentials that I have presented a moment ago um, are defined by the GLIFE VLEI credential governance framework which is a trust over IP compliant layer three governance framework. So the lower arrow here. Um, and I think um, we can say with a certain pride that these two governance frameworks are the most comprehensive frameworks ever created within trust over IP by far. A bit on the implementation of the VLEI. We have selected CARI, the key event receipt infrastructure um, and some related technical capabilities like ACDC credentials and CESAR proof signatures to implement the VLEI. And the background is um, we've been dealing with this topic for quite some years already. Um, and we have done quite some proof of concepts also with ledger applications and different systems. 
Um, and it's not that these proof of concept were not successful, it worked out. So what we wanted to do worked. But whatever we tried, um, it worked exactly on that platform. And if anybody who wanted to use a verifiable LEI did use another platform or another technique, then it wouldn't work because it was not compatible. And that's something that wouldn't work out for the Global LEI Foundation because we need to be inclusive. We want to make the VLEI, which is not an application, which is a piece of infrastructure. We want that to be working for anybody who wants to use this. Um, and this is what we want to achieve with Carry because here we have a portability and an interoperability. Um, I have here the GitHub link for those who want to read more details about Carry, and also there's a list of these related technologies that I mentioned, so ACDC credentials um, and many more. And yes, Carry is quantum safe, um, which means that Carry identifiers, should there ever be a quantum computer that really can do something, would be resistant against such attacks. And this allows us to create what we call a network of networks. I have term, heard this term many times today. Um, the idea is the following. So we have created uh, capabilities for issuance, verification, and revocation of VLEIs. And we do not need a blockchain or distributed ledger for this, but we can connect to any ledger-based application um, by creating so-called carry tunnels. Now, um, we wanted to actually start with a Hyperledger Indie Carry Tunnel um, because most of the projects that we have talked with that have expressed interest so far uh, for a VLEI are actually based on that technology. Um, but as a matter of fact, we didn't make it to find a partner who would be willing to do this with us. So I also want to use this opportunity here if any of you is working in a Hyperledger Indie environment and needs organizational identity, please talk to me after the meeting. Um, would be happy to, to show this with somebody. It shouldn't be too much effort involved, but without a practical use case, it's a bit boring. So, a lot has happened this year and also recently. Uh, I already mentioned the ecosystem governance framework, um, which has been created based on trust over IP foundation standards. Ours consists of one primary document and now 20 additional so-called controlled documents, so 21 documents in total. Um, and we published the initial draft of these documents on our website already in February this year. And we'll update it at launch later this year. Um, but here's a link if you want to check it out already. And like everything else that Glyph do is doing, this is open source, so it's not something that we hide. Um, you can not only look at it, you can use it, you can copy and paste for your own use cases. So if you want to do a governance framework on trust over IP, feel free to steal. Regarding software development and infrastructure, um, in order to achieve what we have done so far, we have supported the open source development of uh, the carry um, protocol and these related technical specifications as far as we need it. And you will find on GitHub, um, first of all, in the Web of Trust carry folder, a lot of this stuff, but also there's a VLEI folder uh, where we have the VLEI specifics. Um, on top of that, which is kind of the back end of the VLEI, we have created a, a front end user interface called Keep, um, which supports Glyph tasks and also basic VLEI issuer tasks. So we have a end to end uh, method to play this through. Um, and this is a workflow based system because, to be honest, um, creating identifiers, managing identifiers with private and public keys, issuing and receiving credentials is not exactly what most people are used to. And this is a way where we guide users step by step through what they need to do depending on the use case they will fulfill and make it a bit more accessible to also the not so technical people who will certainly have to operate this if, um, if we want this to be at large. And yes, we're also about to stand up the production infrastructure. So uh, we have already set up some carry witnesses. Witnesses are one of the carry components that you can use for verification um, for the Glyph root AID. Um, yeah, and this is ongoing. So um, actually what we want to achieve is by the end of this year, we want the first production VLEI issued. In this case, um, we want it by a real qualified VLEI issuer to Glyph. So keep fingers crossed. Yeah, talking about VLEI issuers, um, 
there is a qualification program that I mentioned before. Um, it's quite strict and um, it is mandatory for any qualified VLI issuer to go through that. Um, again, it's also quite comprehensive. It's one agreement with seven appendices and they are available again on the live website. And the process is fully up and running. So whoever wants to become a qualified VLEI issuer can apply now and um, start the qualification process with LIFE. Yeah, and we're coming to a first implementation for a real application. So um, for the GLIFE annual report, we, um, we wanted to show how digital signatures signatures based on VLEIs can be used, um, and especially in this case, what partial signatures can bring for benefits. So all of you have seen PDF documents signed with uh, digital certificates, where then it's like a stamp on the screen where you see, okay, there's the signature, and it affects basically the whole document. But in reality, um, you do not always want to sign a whole document, but sometimes it's important that you are able to just sign a certain fraction. And that was actually the case for Glyph's annual report for many years now, because um, we did do signatures with digital certificates in the past. And the problem was that our auditors, the external auditors, Ernst and Young, actually didn't feel very well with signing the whole report when they have only checked the financial aspect with it, which is two or three pages of the report. Um, so what has happened, um, we had a QBI, not a real one, because there is none uh, non-qualified yet, but one who played that role, who actually issued credentials um, to Glyph and several persons acting for Glyph, including the auditors. So this is a great example for a, um, for a non-official organizational role credential because obviously our auditors have no official role for Glyph. <laughs> then um, these people signed the submission. Some signed the whole report, for example, the CEO to confirm that this is the Glyph report and others like the external auditors or our CFO only signed the financial part. Um, and this is now available on our website and um, these digital signatures are based on verifiable credentials, VLEIs, and can be verified. So, and we wanna look at that now. So we're going again to our website. well hidden in Glyph governance. Is this annual report? Yes. Thank you. Here we go. So since the creation of the foundation, we've been publishing these reports like, like other organizations do, and we started doing this just in PDF versions. And um, the first time in 2019, for 2018, we created our annual report not only in PDF, but also in XBRL, which is Extensible Business Reporting Language. Um, and that's a structured format. It's a machine-readable format, so all the facts can be uh, machine processed, but it still is nicely consumable also by human beings because it comes with a style sheet, which makes it basically look like a PDF. And um, we did sign these with digital certificates. And this year for the first time, for last year, we did the same, but we signed it with, um, with a VLEI. And this can be nicely rendered in the browser. You don't need a plugin or something. Um, so what you see here is the annual report. It looks like a PDF, but it is XHTML with style sheets. Um, and I'm just scrolling to the financial part. Here we go. And um, you can see the power of this structure. So XBL allows you to, has this uh, structured information, which means you can, for example, click on any value. You can look up the IFRS definition. What does it mean? Uh, the actual value. You can see the change towards previous year. And very importantly, you see which entity is this about. And that's again, Glyph's legal entity identifier. So if we click here, we come to our reference data page. And now to the signatures. So here is a digital signatures tab where you can see all the VLEI person credentials that have signed this report, either signed in full, like for example our CEO, 
or partially signed. For example, our head of communications did not sign the financial part. Now, um, it's great to see that they signed something, but what did they sign? And that's now the power of um, these CESAR proof signatures. Um, basically, in this XML, there are some explicit um, areas, uh, facts, as we call them, um, and you can put a signature to such a fact. So that when I now select my colleague Ines, nothing happens here visually, but by selecting Annette, who is our chief financial officer, you can now see that all the financial figures have been signed by her, all these facts. Um, and not only by her, so again, by clicking on such a number on this pane, you also see the list of signatures down here. So very nicely, you can see CFO has signed it. These are the two auditors from NY. CEO signed it, board chair signed it, general counsel signed it. Um, and again, always this triple here, the legal name of the person, the role in the context of the organization and the LEI. This is what I showed earlier. And uh, all of this verifiable. So anyway, this is now on our website with an extended validation certificate. So you could anyway trust that it comes from Glyph. But imagine this is downloaded, stored in some cloud or on a local disk. Then of course this connection is lost. But the signature stays. So wherever you take this, you can still verify that this is actually originating from Glyph. And um, this um, brings, of course, this independence and you secure the content instead of the system. And I think that is, that is the future of how such things should be managed. Coming to the end, um, why are we doing all this? Um, I think it's not news that digital transformation is happening. Things, how we interact and ways how we interact are changing. More and more things happen online. And for these things, it's really important uh, to have a digital identity with a strong authentication. And um, the VLEI is supposed to address exactly these needs in, in any industry that you can imagine. So. Representatives from all of these industries listed here have approached us and are very interested in this topic. It's really a thing. Um, and why is it important for Glyph? Well, each VLEI requires an LEI. We have talked about coverage earlier, so we want the LEI system to grow and have a greater coverage of organizations worldwide because it's like with the telephone. The more people that have an LEI, the more useful it's for the consumers, and that's Glyph's mission. Thank you so much, and I believe we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any. <laughs> and I think Andrea was first. Uh, yes, thanks, Jacinta, for this insightful presentation. Can you comment on um, the legal validation of the signatures by Annette? Of course, in particular in Germany, we have something called qualified electronic signatures, which Yeah, so Andre asked about the legal validity of such technical signatures with VLEIs, especially in the context, for example, in Europe. I think you're also looking at EIDAS frameworks and stuff like that. So um, at the moment, there's a lot of movement in this area, and EIDAS 2 is in preparation. Um, and we're looking into this because, of course, that's important that that works. Um, there are some ideas how this can be done. Uh, we're currently exchanging with several um, organizations there to make this work. Um, one idea could be actually a co-signing. So if a legal entity credential would be signed with um, a classical digital certificate, which is EIDAS compliance, uh, you could derive from this as a, in a delegation way that also the role credentials are compliant with that because that's also possible today. I mean, in organizations without any digital approach, you can, um, you can um, yeah, uh, task others to do things and um, basically uh, delegate powers. That's one aspect, um, but this is really in the making as the, the legislation is not done yet. Uh, we don't know how this will look at the end game. Yes, please. <coughs> Yes. 
Okay. So I'm aware of the GLM code by GS1, which also can identify. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'm hearing the term for the first time, but I know that the prefix of the GLN is supposed to identify the legal entity. So uh, we're collaborating with GS1. GS1 is also an LEI issuer, by the way. Yeah. Which would be completely okay. So I think um, the LEI number and then with the VLEI would have its benefits, especially on a global scale. And the let's say the precision is um, a bit different, I would say, to GS1 codes because sometimes you don't even have uh, reference data with GS1 codes. Um, there is no global database where you can look up uh, a GLN, for example. Again, I don't know how the blue number works. Okay, cool. Perhaps we can catch up after the session and you tell me a bit about it. I think the lady was first. Any questions for governments on this aspect? So uh, we're talking to governments about this, yeah. So there are, I, I cannot say which one, but there are governments who think about implementing this on a whole. I have to say uh, it's more small governments at the moment for small countries. But um, it is interesting to them because governments anyway look into SSI as we have heard this morning. Um, and uh, especially those who anyway plan to implement LEIs on a national scale. So there are governments who think about that because yeah, it has some advantages over a local identifier, especially for those organizations who do a, a lot of cross-border uh, applications. So I mean, of course, in every organ in every country, there are already organizations. So the latter needs to be um, included. But um, I, I could also imagine that if they include this into their company registration process, then you can do it from the get-go. There's no reason to not do that. Um, and you were next, I think. Yes, so question one was how are official organizational representatives actually, or who checks that the legal entity puts the right information in there, right? Mm -hmm. The answer is the qualified VLEI issuer because official organizational role credentials cannot be issued by the legal entity itself. They have to be issued by the QVI to have this independent third party authentication. Second question was, um, I forgot it. Ah, how the, how the actual like onboarding is done. Yeah, there are several uh, mechanisms around. We have this already um, for the LEI issuance. So if you, for your organization, want to apply for an LEI, then there's also a check that you are actually an official representative of the organization and are entitled to do that. That includes video identification and things like that. I think here was another question. Yes. 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 So this is an LEI question. Um, there are organizations who are quite complex and have a lot of subsidiaries and do be tracked at, um, in the LEI system. Yes, that's the case. So. Um, the global LEI system does not only collect what we call level one data, which is the reference data like the business card information, but also certain types of ownership information. We call this relationships or level two data. And um, let me show you one example where you can see this quite nicely, um, which is a food manufacturer. Perhaps you have heard about it. 
So here you see the reference data I shown before. Um, and you can also see uh, directly owned organizations. This is based on accounting consolidation, I have to say. And that's quite a lot. And ultimately uh, owned subsidiaries. So this, is, this can include subsidiaries owned by subsidiaries and stuff like this. So here's also uh, this, this structure. So you can step down and see, okay, and then this and this and this. Quite interesting, yeah. But uh, again, this covers only those organizations who have an LEI. That's the limitation. Yes, uh, I should have said that earlier. All LEI data is available for free. You don't even need a registration. You can download this as various file types, XML, JSON, CSV. You can use the search engine. We also have an API that you can use for free. All of this is available for free. I'll have that checked for you. Might be annoying, but uh, we'll, we'll see what it is. Uh, Here's somebody who didn't ask a question yet. I'll take him first, yeah. question is if we think that VLEIs will be used for legal documents like contracts and stuff, um, absolutely. So you're just saying that this argument is not applicable Yes, this, this is something that we haven't seen in other contexts and we're working for example with um, supply chain people who do uh, shipping of goods and you have their bills of lading and stuff like that and these are documents which are extended also through their life cycle and then Basically, the one has in the hand doesn't want to sign what somebody else did two years ago. They just want to sign what they added. Yeah, and these these are use cases that we can imagine well. And now you again. So this is all based on rock policy. Um, we at Glyph, we don't say, ah, let's collect this or this information. So this is the regulatory oversight committee who basically who tasks us to do this. At the moment, we have in scope accounting consolidation. This is what I showed here. We have funds relationships and, um, and we have international branches. What you mentioned, we do not have. And I wonder also if this is publicly available information because everything that we collect needs to be publicable. Okay, cool. So this should be answered in many ways. So you're asking there are other types of relationships, for example, partial ownerships up to 10% of ownership, which are not covered with accounting consolidation and whether it was thought about also collecting these. Technically, we could completely because the model is very flexible. We have just a relationship type which can have many meanings and that can be done. Again, um, what it means is that all 39 LEI issuers would have to collect this information and this needs to be mandated by the ROC. This, this is the reason. Um, so it could be done. It has been decided against it because it was seen as not very feasible on a global scale because these things also have to work always in every country on the planet. Um, but these are certainly things that could be considered. Jeff, did you want to comment on that?
perfectly the, the discussion about whether or not you do accounting consolidation versus ownership or control was a consideration and it was thought at the time that uh, it would be easier to validate accounting consolidation because there are in fact uh, audit confirmed or compliant information. And validation of information is important, but the model for relationship is just a graph model where you have a relationship between two nodes and you can add any number of uh, types of relationships in the future and you'll have a knowledge graph. But I will have to say just as someone who spent six years on the board of Slice working with Christoph and the and now I'm on a different project at Linux Foundation. This is really a tremendous advance in identity management to link individual open offices with companies. And I would say that even for, for Hyperledger Fabric, in which you have for you have the need for certificates to identify parties, that um, and there's a thought that in fact using uh, decentralized IDs and so forth, that the concept of a uh, of DLEI uh, and this type of identity is something that in the future I think is, is the kind of thing that would be The good thing with the LEI is we're not intending to replace any other identity system, but we're actually embracing them. So we already have several mapping programs in place, as you can see here. We carry also the big codes and ISINs. Um, we're also working with GS1 on the GLN as we speak. And now that I learn about a new one, we'll certainly also look into this one because there's no point in, in replacing them. Um, the LEI should be what we call the linchpin for any identity system so that you can map and match, but without string matching, which just is not efficient. Thank you. Okay, one last. Yeah, what's the process of trying to get organizations to get an LEI and get a DLEI? So, you know, you get the knowledge out there and the requirements to say, this is the way that I want to do business in the future, and this would enable me So the question is, how is the information and the, the offer of LEIs and VLEIs brought to those who should get one? Um, that's not a short answer, unfortunately. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. So the global LEI system is a federated system. I talked about LEI issuers and VLEI issuers. So Glyph itself does not interact with the end users, the holders of LEIs and VLEIs. Um, there's much more. There are registration agents, there are validation agents, which work again for LEI and VLEI issuers to even make this broader. And of course, Glyph uh, is doing um, advertising, uh, press releases, social media actions, uh, going to conferences, speaking in front of people to make this known. But there's really a big network of people doing this who also are incentivized to, um, to get it done. And some do this uh, really successful. Right, then thank you very much again and have a fantastic afternoon. See you all tonight.